looking at our sixth big section in our journey through Revelation. We've seen lots and lots of warnings so far. And in today's section, we see that the warnings are over. We're given a picture of the final judgment, judgment of all of those who refuse to repent and turn and worship the Lamb. It is a difficult section to stomach at times. But as we work through this section, it really should help to grow our love for Jesus. And I hope as we work our way through that you'll see exactly why that is the case. As always, I encourage you to read through the passage a few times, familiarize yourself with the content of this big section, and note down repetition and interesting ideas that come out. Uh, spend some time praying. Pray that God would help you to understand his word, that he would help you to teach it well to those who, who you will be teaching, that he will challenge and change you through this part of his word. And as always, I'm going to highlight things that I've noticed in this passage as I've worked my way through. One key that John uses as um, he goes through different sections is he uses key words to show transitions in scenes. And in this section, it's the words, I saw, or after this, I looked. Verse 1 sets the scene for us. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues, because with them God's wrath is completed. So that's what this section is about. This section is showing us what the completed wrath of God looks like. And we can see that as John picks up in the rest of these verses, we're looking at the wrath of God, these bowls filled with the wrath of God. So that is the overarching theme of what we see in these verses. It's God's wrath being poured out. But it's important to note that there's a, a little interlude here. Before we see the wrath poured out, John sees a, a different um, picture. He sees the sea of glass. You'll remember that from uh, Revelation chapter 4. It's a picture of God calm and in control in heaven. But here it's glowing with fire, a picture of the calmness in heaven is now about to be shown God's wrath, his, his white hot anger against sin being poured out. Um, but we, we see those who have been victorious. And it's very important for us to hold on to this picture as we go through the whole of this uh, big section. So this crowd, those who have been victorious, are singing the song of God's servant Moses, and that's also important, the song of Moses, a lot of the images that are picked up through the section echo back to Exodus and particularly the plagues in Egypt. So it's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Uh, the Lamb, we've also seen from chapter 5 in Revelation, the, the Lamb is a picture of Jesus, the victorious one, the Lamb who was slain but is now seated in power on the throne and this crowd of victorious ones are singing, great and marvelous are your deeds. And just that little phrase, great and marvelous, links us with another great and marvelous sign that we see. The great and marvelous sign is God's wrath being completed. And the song is saying, great and marvelous are your deeds. The completed wrath of God is a part of God's great and marvelous deeds. The completed wrath of God is showing that God is just and true. He is to be worshipped because his righteous acts have been revealed and one place in which they are revealed is in his completed wrath. So we've got to remember that what we're looking at here is not God out of control. This is God in control dealing with sin. This is God showing that he is just and true. If God didn't deal with sin, if he didn't judge sin, then he wouldn't be a just God. He wouldn't be a God worth worshipping. But here we see that all nations will come and worship before God because of his righteous acts. And now we're going to see part of those righteous acts being revealed in the next section. Um, we see, I looked and I saw in heaven... So this is in the place where God is. It's the temple in heaven. 
So just that showing that what is starting here starts in heaven. This is from God. God himself is pouring out these bowls of wrath. Important to note again, we see um, seven angels with seven plagues, seven golden bowls. Just remembering in Revelation 7 is the number of completeness. So what we're about to see is the complete wrath of God being poured out. What we saw in earlier chapters as the trumpets were sounded, it was a partial judgment, a third of the earth, a third of the sea, a third, so on. Here it is the completed wrath of God. This is the full and final punishment. And what we see is this punishment is shown as bowls being poured out. So these seven bowls are poured out in this section. Now, again, seven, the number of completeness. We shouldn't be expecting these things to happen one at a time. But these bowls being poured out, we look at them one at a time just to give us something tangible to hold on to. But we should actually imagine the full force of all of this happening all at once as, as God's wrath is poured out. And they are terrible things to see, these festering sores breaking out on the people, reminding us of the plague of boils in Exodus. So like the plague of boils, reminding us that this is far worse. Um, they're breaking out all over the people, the people who have the mark of the beast and worship his image. So this is breaking out on those who, who do not know and love God. As the second and third bowls are poured out, we see blood, like the plague of blood in Exodus. But this is on a global scale. All the seas turn to blood, and then the rivers and springs all become blood. It really is a gruesome picture. Um, blood that brings death. Blood that the people uh, have to drink because there's nothing else to drink. Um, this shows us, though, that the punishment fits the crime because as the people have shed blood, the, the blood of God's people, his holy people and his prophets, so God gives them blood to drink as they deserve. Um, and again, it is... A picture of God's completed wrath being poured out and the plagues in Exodus are in view here. And then we see as the uh, fifth bowl is poured out here, we see darkness like in Exodus 10, 21 to 29. Uh, but this is a, a darkness that... It, brings these people into agony. The people are gnawing their tongues in agony. And it's almost like everything is coming together. So the boils and the blood and uh, the scorching heat of the fourth bowl and the darkness, they all cause the people to gnaw their tongues in agony. But we see here that they end up cursing God. We see it twice. They cursed the name of God. They cursed the God of heaven. We see it right at the end again. They cursed God. The terrible, sad reality in this section is that people have ignored the warnings in history. And now, on the day of judgment, they continue to curse God. We see this. They refuse to repent and glorify him. They refused to repent of what they had done. See, the terrible reality is that if people do not repent in this life, they will not repent in eternity. The opportunity to repent is now. And so this picture of the final judgment of these bowls being poured out is God in his mercy showing us, telling us what it's going to be like in the end, before it's too late. As the sixth bowl is poured out, 
we see it's brought out on the river Euphrates. Um, this links us back with Isaiah 15, where uh, the river Euphrates is dried up and the, the kings from the east come. This is another picture of all those aligned against God coming to uh, make war against God. And then we see these three impure spirits look like frogs. Uh, so again, uh, linking back to the plague of frogs in Exodus. And they're coming out of the mouth of the dragon. We met the dragon and the beast. And the false prophet is just another name for the second uh, beast. So the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet spew out these frog-like evil spirits. And what these evil spirits do is they fool people into thinking that they can stand against God. So they go to the kings the kings of the whole world, and gather them for battle. They are fooling them into thinking that they can stand against God and win. And this perhaps rings true of Psalm 2, where we see the kings of the, the earth standing against God and against his anointed one. But what we'll see in a moment is that they cannot win. In verse 15, we have this little interlude. In the midst of this looming battle, God's people are told by Jesus. So this is the voice of Jesus speaking to them. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed. So the idea here is be ready. Yes, life is going to be hard. Yes, there is going to be this uh, battle that is going to be set up. And the kings of the whole world actually... Uh, all those who are aligned against God will think that they can beat God. But Jesus is saying, stay awake, be ready, remain clothed. Don't be like those who go naked and are shamefully exposed. And then verse 16, we're back to the, um, the battle scene. And we're told here about Armageddon. So Armageddon is just a picture of the place where the final battle takes place. Um, it's linked with the Mount of uh, or Megiddo. In the Old Testament where, where battles took place. But this is now the final battle. And again there's lots of Old Testament references. Uh, the gathering kings. Reminds us of Zechariah 14 verse 2. Gathering for battle. Um, but when this final bowl is poured out. Even though the kings have gathered to fight against God. As the final bowl is poured out, we hear these words, it is done. It is done. Does that ring true of anywhere else in scripture? Jesus on the cross. It is finished. So although the kings are aligning themselves, they've been fooled by these evil spirits to think that they can beat God. They hear this final word, it is done. And this picture is just creation as we know it coming undone. There's massive storms and an earthquake like no earthquake that's ever been. Um, we see these words here where it says, God remembered Babylon. Um, Babylon is a picture of all of those who align themselves against God. And we're going to see in the next big section that Babylon is fully and finally judged. So this phrase is fleshed out in the next section. But what we, we see here is this is the end of the world as we know it. And all those who align themselves against God definitely do not feel fine. This is a fulfillment of uh, prophecies like Ezekiel. But again, you see, if people didn't turn to God in history they won't turn to God in eternity. Now, although this picture is awful, we have to keep this in mind. What John is seeing is a part of the great and marvelous deeds of God. This is God showing that he is just and true. This is showing his righteous acts being revealed in judging sin. What this all shows us is that sin is a really big problem. And God is a God who is just. He cannot leave sin unpunished. And this is hard for us to stomach. 
But as Christians, as we read through this and we see the, the wrath of God being poured out against sin, it should make us realize that this is the wrath that we deserve. But amazingly, this is the wrath that Jesus took for us. So this whole big section should cause us to love Jesus more because the full fury of God's wrath, these bowls of God's wrath, were poured out on Jesus. He took this for us. That reality should blow our minds. What an incredible Savior we have. And so as we look at this, we need to listen to these words of Jesus. The one who has saved us, who's taken this wrath for us. He says, stay awake, remain clothed. So be ready for this day. The only way that we can be ready is by continuing to trust in Jesus. But another way that this whole section should impact us is that we should want others around us to be getting ready for this day of wrath. God's wrath will be completed one day as these bowls are fully and finally poured out and we should be wanting those around us to get ready. And so we should be taking the opportunity now to in love warn people before it's too late. So as we rejoice in the gospel for ourselves may we also hold out the gospel to others and let's never get used to reading sections like this they really should churn our stomachs as we realize the the extent of our sin and what we deserve the judgment we deserve because of our sin but then we should stand and say oh the wonder of the reality that Jesus took this judgment for us what a great savior we have and we're going to see in a couple of weeks time the final picture in revelation as the judgment is completed and those who have stayed awake, those who have remained clothed, those who are ready will rejoice and sing great and marvelous are your deeds as God comes and wipes every tear from every eye. Well, God bless as you teach this to others. May this truth remind you of the seriousness of sin and grow your wonder at the reality of belonging to Jesus, the one who has taken God's wrath on himself so that we can go free. God bless.